Okay. Uh, first, let me um, thank everyone for coming in today uh, to view the class. As uh, Jay mentioned, I'm going to speak today about uh, wall repair, uh, priming, uh, and finishing top coats. Uh, first, I'd like to start with going over a few of the tools you probably need. Uh, there's a nice little checklist up here as well. Uh, did you remember a uh, list here for you? Uh, but when we're doing any job, it, one of the worst things you have to do is stop in the middle of a project and start over again because you need another tool or something else that you didn't grab. So it's always best to kind of plan ahead and make sure you have uh, everything on hand to, to keep your project on time and to help keep you from going crazy. Um, some of the things that you'll definitely need for re repairing walls would be some type of sand, some type of sanding paper or sanding pad or disc or something like this to smooth out uh, your repairs and any other uh, uh, wall issues you may have. Um, it's also a good idea to have a, a block that you can actually attach the sandpaper to. Again, these are uh, the smaller ones, the foam ones are, are kind of all in one and they're really nice for getting inside corners and around trim and things like that. The uh, blocks are much better for bigger areas on the wall or even using maybe a pole sander if you're, you're getting up high or maybe doing a repair on a ceiling or installing a, uh, 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 a ceiling fan and you need to fix some, some, something from that. Um, so that's another option. The other thing is uh, a good um, a good drywall knife, a saw, or a uh, um, a good a razor blade knife is also very important and key uh, to making some repairs. Of course, once you make the repair, you're going to have to fix the repair. So a variety of different spackling and joint compounds you can use. Um, some dry very quickly. Some are very very lightweight. Uh, the vinyl ones, which this is about less than half the size of this one actually weighs more than the big one does. This is a lightweight material. This is a vinyl compound. Some of these can be used interior or exterior. Um, there are some limitations on dry time and different things like that. Uh, I always suggest reading the back of the label or talking to the store professional before you start your job to make sure you got the right compound for what you're doing. Uh, some jobs might require actually two different ones. Sometimes you need a heavier, a full bodied one for the larger repairs and then uh, something like a lightweight one to go over the top of it for your, for your final coat or something like that. Uh, there are also different types of patches available. Um, you have a straight mesh patch and this is kind of a, a, a newer one here. Um, this one you actually uh, repair a hole and it comes with the uh, paper, a little piece of drywall in it attached and everything and we'll, we'll review that in a little bit. Um, never hurts to have a good scraper on hand either. Um, it's a very important tool. You get a good scraper like this and if you hang on to it, it should pretty much last your whole life. Um, so a small investment for something you'll probably have for a very long time. Um, also before you start painting, uh, some of the things that you might need would be different kinds of tapes. There's a lot of different kinds of tapes. Quality is going to mean a lot. A lot of times on the less expensive products, you'll get bleed through at the tape line. The more expensive products, typically higher in quality will help you keep a, a good crisp paint line. Um, also prior to painting, you're going to want to make sure to, uh, your cleanup is easy. There's very nice uh, inexpensive disposable drop cloths from canvas to mesh to paper types of material um, and plastic. And of course we do have the uh, more heavy duty kind of professional ones if you're doing extensive work or it's something that you do for a living or you do on weekends or something like that. You do repairs in your own building or apartment building. And then of course we'll uh, get into the primers and the top coats. Does anyone have any questions so far about uh, anything we've discussed yet? All right, great. Well, we'll get into the, uh, oh, and the uh, one last thing I wanted to mention too is the uh, drywall tape. And this is used for larger repairs. Um, this is the, the mesh kind, which is the one I typically prefer for uh, intermediate or novice uh, weekend warriors, if you will, taking on your own projects. Um, could you make me all right, can't, can't seem to unravel a roll of tape. So, I, um, But I wanted to show you a couple little things here as far as some repair go. Um, these are very small repairs, kind of resembling what a lot of us see with little nail holes, things like that in the drywall. Most of the time, these don't require anything special other than just a, a top coat of a patch, maybe a second coat with a light sanding when you're done. A little bit deeper patch, a little bit deeper scar is going to require more attention. And then, of course, we've got teenagers or someone upset. This is good size because it's... It's bigger than your fist, so it'll cover up most of the holes, especially even in, around the college here. Uh, so that's probably why they designed it that size. 
Um, one trick I will tell you that uh, I, I've picked up over the years is a lot of times, especially with nail holes, you will get a lot of uh, the, the, the material, the actual paper from the drywall will be sticking up when the nail is removed. And you really do want to um, have that either flush with this or removed. An easy way to do it is to take a pencil or a pen or even this tool and just poke in where that nail was and then that'll set that just below the surface for you because you don't want these hairs sticking up after you patch it. Uh, you could sand it and then if you start tearing it you could actually start pulling the paper off and then you're going to have a bigger mess to clean up. So minor repairs like this are typically very easy. I usually like the, doing the, the really lightweight stuff because it's easy to move around and it dries quickly. Um, for something like this we just need a small amount. We put a small amount on there, small amount over these holes, allow this to dry, come back and give it a light sanding, and, uh, and then you're ready for your second coat, light sanding, and then your primer. Uh, depending on, uh, I hear that. There'll be some cuts in this video. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, editing purposes only. Um, the, uh, um, uh, let's see, I kind of lost my place here. This would need uh, one, one light sanding after this and maybe another coat uh, of, of drywall compound and the light sanding. Depending on the product you're using, environmental conditions, it's going to depend on how quickly you can paint over it. Some of these products are going to dry pretty quickly and recommend that you can be painted in just a few hours. Some of them will say overnight or even longer depending on the product, depending on drying conditions and how much of the product you actually use. Um, sometimes we, we do have deeper repairs and things like that. Um, we're going to have a lot of compound and stuff like that. It's going to take longer for it to dry. So, one, one more, one more adjustment. All right, a little quiet. Let's try that. All right, how's that? That's much better. Thank you. Uh, for these larger repairs, Jay was kind enough to uh, to uh, get the tape started for me. The thing I like about this over conventional paper tape is this actually has an adhesive on it so it will stick where you want it to go. Uh, normally, uh, something like this is used for the larger repairs or if you're joining two sheets of drywall in the seam joint to put the two pieces of drywall together. Uh, I'll show you how this is used on a moderately small hole here. Um, typically, you can either put it on prior to or post, um, post compound. And most of the time, it's better just to put it on first, although you can put it on afterwards because this has a lot of nice holes for the compound to go through. So I recommend for the first coat. The other thing you want to be careful is you really don't want to build any of these up too high because one, these all do harden and dry. Some of them are easier to get off than others, but a lot of them can be um, quite a bit difficult, more difficult to sand. So you don't want to get a big build up on there where you're going to have to put a lot of effort into it later and do some sanding. Uh, once you get your material on there, uh, you can take your, your patch, get it to the length you want, and cut it with your handy scraper tool. They say nine and one, it's probably got a million different uses. Um, put this right over the patch itself. Again, with that tape on there, or the uh, adhesive, it'll stick nicely to your surface. You don't have to worry about it. Then you come back and put another light coat just over the tape here. Um, make a nice mess on the table. This is why you have a drop cloth. Just wanted to demonstrate that for you. Um, put a nice coat on here. Spread it out nice and even. And again, try Right away, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you want to get that smoothed out and get your first coat on there. Um, the first coat doesn't have to be perfect, but you definitely want to be sure, like I said before, is you don't want to have too much of a buildup on it because then you're, you're going to be coming back doing a lot of sanding on this later. Uh, something that is large, this size or larger between like two sheets of drywall, um, normally that would take three, sometimes four, four different coats to get it as smooth as you like. A lot of it depends on your wall, the existing wall, and what's on the wall. Keep in mind when we do a repair, especially over an existing wall, a lot of times what you'll have is you'll have a wall that's had multiple coats of paint on it, and the wall will have a little bit of a texture from that. Now you're putting a nice smooth coat on here, then you're going to sand it smooth and put another smooth coat on top of that. So you could notice a texture difference, yes. Of paint and wallpaper. <laughs> Quite a mess. Yeah, and that, the, the, that, that's probably the biggest reason residentially we, we eased off a lot of using wall coverings, uh, wallpaper and things like that, because when you want to change it, it is very difficult. You have to you know, remove the paper, uh, prime and seal it very well. Um, and if you try to rush that process, because we use a lot of water to take that off, you can get blisters and have drying issues and different problems with your paint, as well as your spackle. Um, yes? And what purpose does that screen 
Well, a lot of these compounds, when you put them on, they will shrink a little bit, and this helps keep them from cracking, um, especially if you've got a wider gap like you would have on an, a, a, like a butt joint or if you would have a, a larger repair that you're doing. If you didn't use the tape, uh, you run the risk of having to get crack in the middle of the joint. And this stuff really does kind of a, once you get a crack in, in mud, if you will, or, or joint compound, it's very difficult. It doesn't like to repair itself or even painting over it. Uh, a lot of times that little hairline crack will show again. This definitely helps uh, uh, keep that at bay. Um, also, um, keep in mind, I, I didn't mention we have, you have general drywall repair from damage. And there's also uh, what we call stress, stre stress cracks um, in coating. So typically happen above doors and windows, your exterior door. I actually have one in my house. Um, and this is caused by either movement of the door, maybe someone like slamming doors, or more commonly what happens is your building starts settling and as your, your, your structure settles, it creates stress. And of course, the easiest place to crack isn't gonna be the middle of the drywall, it's gonna be the joint here where the compound is. And again, the tape will help a little bit with that, but if you have a moving stress crack, um, there's no amount of tape or um, patching that's gonna permanently fix that. The structure itself would have to be addressed, so. Do you have a question back there anywhere? Okay, again, after these are dry, we come back with our sanding block, give these a nice coat. In fact, these are almost dry, which is kind of why I like using the lightweight stuff, especially on the, the smaller, um, smaller nail holes and things like that. Uh, we just give this a simple, real simple light sanding. And then we put one more finish coat on. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there can be a little bit of a shadow depending on where you leave your, your spackling in that because it will dry and it'll dry a little bit more opaque. Uh, as, it, as it dries, it'll get a little bit more opaque and you'll be able to see that a little bit more. Um, oh, are we talking about the shadow in the middle? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah there's, um, there's a little bit of a bold here. Again, as I talked about with the nail holes, you do want to make sure the drywall tape or the paper itself is either flush or a little bit below the surface. As you can see here in this one, I didn't really do that. Um, and on the tape here, you'll almost always, especially when you're using the tape with these, they'll be pretty flush. But with the tape joints, they're gonna be a little bit higher uh, than the rest of the wall. So it's gonna protrude a little bit from the wall, which is why we typically will step up with wider and wider joint marks until we get to almost a 12 inch wide on both sides where we can really blend that in. The more blending that you can do in, the less obvious it's gonna to be to your eye. But again, keep in mind, I did mention earlier, a lot of times, especially with the buildings that have been around for a long time, the walls have a little texture to them and now you're making a nice smooth patch. So you might see a little bit of a texturing difference there. Um, same thing with this. Once this dries, it can be lightly sanded. Again, then we would go with a heavier coat on either side of this again to disperse that patch out a little bit. Uh, any questions? Well, not necessarily heavier, but definitely wider. You'd want to bring it out to the, the full about six inches of this blade. And eventually, if you can, depending on the size of the repair, maybe even go up to a 12 inch blade. Right, so, so the original, so the height here gradually tapers off back in. And that's kind of how they do the same repairs on your cars, except they're a lot more critical on your car than it is on a wall, uh, especially because of the function of sheen. Uh, when we get into paint, we'll talk about the sheen and how sheen can affect your repair and what you want to do with walls that might not look so perfect and things like that. Um, the next step is filling, making, fixing those large holes. Someone might have got aggressive on your wall or an angry teenager or something. Um, there are patch, uh, specific patches. This is one of the metal patches and this will just basically asphyxiate right over where the hole is and then you simply mud that in the same process, spread it out as wide as you can on your second and your third coats to make sure that you're, you're giving it a chance to transition from the, the flat of the drywall to that little increase and then back down again to keep your eye from distracting. So is it literally you're not putting a new piece of drywall and you're putting that? Correct, you're putting this right over the hole, right over where the hole would be. It'll be a little weaker than a regular drywall? It'll be a little weaker, but again, most of the time we're not really putting too much pressure on the walls. I mean, if this was in an area you're gonna use again with going to hang another picture there in a couple months or the next? No, absolutely not. No, you'd want to do a major repair. And for something like that, if you're going to need the wall to be, you know, structurally sound to hang pictures or something like that, the really, really what you need to do is cut a chunk of it out and put this, uh, another chunk back in there and then go back to your tape system and, um, 
what did I do with it now? And tape the uh, and tape the whole thing off. It's underneath here. There. Nope, it's right not. Top. Right on. Oh, here we go. It's too close to me. Yeah, tape the seam. Absolutely. Um, all all four sides of it. About half on each side. Uh, well, you don't want it to be too big because again, these these compounds can crack. So or well. Too small, isn't that, you want to be sure it fits. If it's a little snug, it's fine. The thing you really have to watch out for when you do patch like this is you'll notice drywall where it's supposed to, where it butts up against each other. They actually compress this a little bit so you have a little indentation so you can put your paper in there and your plaster and, and keep it almost as, as level with the drywall. When you cut in a patch like this, we don't have that beveled edge anymore. So you just want to be sure and trim your paper off and make sure that you've got enough of an area so you're not, you don't have paper like I do. I have a little bit of paper actually sticking out on this one here. So um, you want to make sure and, and not do that. And also, you're going to want to use a razor blade for cutting this. Drywall saws are nice for making rough holes, but a razor blade will leave a much nicer edge here for you. you again, you don't want a bunch of jagged paper sticking up through your repair. Um, for larger holes that don't need a complete replacement, this is a nice, a nice kit here. This actually comes with a little piece of drywall in the middle of it. And this circle, the styrofoam circle, works as a template. So you put this over the hole on the wall, the template, you draw it out, and then you simply cut that circle out, pop it out, this patch goes on it, and then you see, similar, it's got the tape itself already attached to it, so the whole thing fits over the repair. You've got your tape, drywall, and everything right in that, and then you can just start mudding that in around the, uh, the, the, the hole. You want a clean cut on that hole, but at that point, it's pretty straightforward. Absolutely. And in fact, that hole it doesn't have to be actually quite as clean cut as you would if you were butting a piece of drywall up to it, because this will, the tape will actually cover, um, should cover that hole that you make. Because this, again, this is basically, there's a piece of drywall on here, basically affixed to a piece of drywall tape. So you cut the hole out with the template provided here, pop this right on there, and then start your mudding. So fairly simple process. But again, if you're going to come back here and try to hang a painting, attach it to the spot in the wall, this would not work for something like that. You would need to do a larger repair where you could get some uh, anchor anchor support to your drywall. Um, I'm not too sure. I think this is the. Sorry, okay. I'm I'm sure there are different uh, sizes out there, but really, if you start getting too much bigger than this, probably almost better off going to replace the whole board and piece uh, the sheet like that. What, what do you support it with? Well, you know, there's a lot of tricks to the trade. You know, um, theoretically, you could cut it back to the studs and expose half of the stud. That gets really difficult. A lot of times, people will just put a backer board on either side of the stud, screw or nail it into the stud, and then just screw or nail the drywall into the, the side supports. Um, a, a quick way of doing it. Another quick way of doing it is taking a, a piece of one by and just actually putting it up against the drywall, making it a couple inches taller and a couple inches longer putting that in before you put the patch on, literally screwing that to the existing drywall, and then putting this on it and screwing that to that piece of wood that you just installed in there. So the f there are a few different ways of doing it. Any other questions? All right, again, I'll, there are a lot of different kinds of compounds out there. Some of them dry relatively quickly. Some do a little bit better job with filling larger gaps and cracks. Normally. The very, the very lightweight stuff that I like to use is, is normally used a little bit more for finishing and not, you're not going to really use it on, on your, your mud compound or your, your joint compounds and things like that. You'd want to step up to a vinyl or, or something like that. All right, for priming and repairing, normally when a lot of paints um, will have what we call paint and primer built in one. I'm sure we've all seen the commercials and the, the marketing and the advertising for that. <laughs> However, I do recommend if you're doing major repairs to your wall, even if you're using a high quality paint, it doesn't hurt to put a good primer on there first. Uh, again, sometimes you don't necessarily need that, but if you're going to do a drastic color change or you're going to have something, this was in the kitchen, where you're going to have a, a satin or a semi gloss type finish on it, you're going to want to make sure that this is sealed well uh, before you put uh, a high quality paint on it. Well, I would use it normally, I would normally, for, for normally when they say paint and primer in one, they're generally referring to your walls in pretty good shape. You're just changing the color. Uh, you're not doing anything too crazy with it. Again, if you're going to jump up a lot in sheen, like you're changing the purpose of a room and you had a flat paint, and now you need a semi-gloss in there, doing a drastic color change, or if you've had a lot of repairs to the wall, I recommend a separate, just a primer. The, the fact that the, the primer is designed to be a primer, 
Um, so it's going to do that part of it, what you want it to do, seal the wall uh, and set it up for your top coats the best you can. Uh, again, painting is probably one of the most effective, uh, um, least expensive ways to change the look of a room. Even use high quality top coats uh, will typically go 400 square feet on your wall. So when you break the cost down per square foot, it's a lot less expensive than say changing a floor or buying uh, new furniture or something like that. Um, so even sometimes if the, uh, the, the paint cost itself seems a little bit uh, high, remember the cost per square foot is going to be extremely low compared to pretty much any other home, home project that you're going to do. One coat of primer typically is plenty, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and a couple uh, quality top coats on top of that. Um, honestly, I, um, I would rather see someone use a high quality primer and lesser quality top coat than the other way around because there, there, there's only, uh, there's an old saying, uh, how many coats of paint can I put on this board? Does anyone know? How many coats of paint can I put on this? As many as I want. Anyone else have any ideas? I can only put one coat. Every other coat's gonna be on that coat. So if the first coat isn't right, then it's going to cause problems for the rest of them. So I always recommend using a good quality primer if you've got major repairs or something like that. So, um, but every other coat would be on top of that coat. Now we can start talking about primers. Um, some of the primers from Benjamin Moore. There are a lot of different primers out on the market. Do a lot of do with a lot of different things. Uh, general primers. However, like I said, if you're doing a lot of major work, doing a lot of work yourself, um, I recommend using a higher quality one. Um, let me uh, remove a few of these things and get them out of the way here for us. So there's the uh, example of a good razor blade knife that you might use. Again, something like this, buying something higher quality where you could just change the blade out, it's just going to save you time and money. As long as you don't lose this, it's probably with you for the rest of your life. So you just need blades for replacement for something like that. Just get a little bit of room to work. And again, like I said, we do have a few different types of primers here. This is our um, Super Spec Latex Enamel Underbody. Um, and over here we have our, um, uh, actually this is our Latex Flat. And uh, we also have our um, Benjamin Moore Fresh Dart as well. Uh, again, using the right primer is just gonna help the whole job go a little bit more smoothly. For top coats, now this is where it's going to depend a lot on the situation, what your expectations are, what's in the environment, and what you really want it to do. So there's a, there's a lot of questions. There's no, no one could say, oh, this is the paint for you, walk out the door with it, because depending on the application, it might not be the right paint. Of course, we have interior and exterior, but we're going to focus on interior paint today uh, and finishes as well. I mentioned earlier uh, kind of how they repair your car is somewhat similar to how you repair a wall. They use Dura or, uh, Bondo and different things like that. However, their repairs have to be a lot more critical than yours, and there's one major reason for that. It's because they're very high in sheen. And the higher in gloss you go from a flat all the way up to a high gloss, while the high glosses are going to offer you the most protection, durability, and washability, and scrubability, they're also going to accentuate any errors or flaws in your wall much more so. So if you have a wall that you've done a lot of repairs to, the building's a little bit older, the wall texture varies a lot from place to place, uh, we suggest using a flat or a matte finish. Yes? Um, not a whole lot. Plaster's similar to drywall, except it's a little bit more tricky because you have the, the, a bigger issue of there's always a texture issue with plaster um, where your wall isn't smooth. And even on new, newer plaster walls, you're going to have uh, texturing variations. And that's probably the biggest issue. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference between repairing that, except unless you're doing major repair. Uh, and, the, and then you, you probably either want some good experience or get a professional and do major repair on plaster. In most cases, you can. Minor repairs. Um, again, large repairs in plaster. To do it right, you need the lath. It needs to be applied properly. And that, that's more of a, uh, an acquired talent. Um, you can kind of make a lot of things look pretty good on your own. But again, if the wall is going to have a lot of variations in it, you're going to want to use a matte or a flat finish to help your eye, distract your eye from any of the variations in your finish. Um, of course, the lower in sheen we go typically, the more difficult it is to clean. Um, uh, we do get the uh, a nice advantage of breaking up any imperfections in there. Um, however, you do start losing a little scrubability and a little bit durability. One product I definitely like to draw your attention to, this is an extremely unique product. 
This is our Aura Bath and Spa product. And what this product does is it literally, um, it's not for wet areas, it's for damp, moist areas where you have a lot of high humidity. Again, for the bathroom, not the shower area. What this literally does is it has an hydrophobic resin in it. And what that does is when there's vapor, moisture vapor in the air, it comes along, gets close to the wall, and the resin literally repels it and pushes it away. So what you don't get is it doesn't support the condensation on the film. So you don't get a lot of runners and things like that on there that you would typically. So if you take a really hot shower without the uh, exhaust fan on, you know, the mirror sweating, the toilet bowl sweating, a lot of times if it's enough, the walls will start sweating. With this product, this will virtually eliminate that because it will literally repel the moisture in the air and not support the condensation on the surface. It's a very unique product and a matte finish. So the only matte finish in the market that we that anyone recommends in, the, in a bathroom or something like that. And this is our Aura, in our Aura line, and our, our Aura line and Benjamin Wars our, um, our, our premium line, so. Is it only in a matte finish then? Or? Well, the bath and spa is only in a matte finish. We have an Aura line with a matte and eggshell, a satin, and a semi-gloss. Because uh, bathrooms, I see, you know, kind of you get a little more gloss uh, than the other rooms. Maybe that would yeah, be so T typically, you do see a higher sheen in the bathroom and the kitchen because you want washability uh, and things like that in the, in the kitchens so and bathrooms. No, actually, well, this was designed specifically for that. Uh, we, when our Aura line first came out, we had a matte, an eggshell, and a satin. And although the matte performed extremely well in bathrooms, we found under extreme conditions that you can have some issues with the matte. So we developed the Aura Bath and Spa, um, the matte finish. Now, if you want to go a little bit higher, we just recommend the Aura eggshell. Um, and which, it, it does not have the resin in it, but, but it is, again, what you mentioned before, the higher sheens can handle the moisture better, and that's typically why when you go in a kitchen or a bathroom, you will see the higher sheens in most people's homes. So your walls are either going to be eggshell or matte finish. You go into the bathroom, and typically they're satin or semi-gloss. And with this, you don't have to step up. That's the whole, whole idea. You don't have to go to a semi-gloss or a satin finish. You can use a matte finish in a, in a purple color, in a blue color, in a red color. Uh, it won't have any issues with anything like that at all. Also, with the Aura Bath and Spa, we, never, um, we guarantee the coverage in never more than two coats. So if you have a, a red or a blue or some kind of crazy color you're going with in any of our Aura sheens, um, we, we, um, there's never more than two coats to achieve the color. So um, keeping the, keep, keep that in mind. There are a few colors. There's some reds and yellows that are very bright and very clean that we have a product called the Color Foundation for. That would count as your first coat, and then putting a top coat of one of the other Aura products would count as your second coat. But they'd be able to tell you that at the counter. Uh, I, will, I will replace your material for you, uh, and we can discuss anything further. You don't want me to paint your walls. So, um, the, uh, A couple other things. Uh, this is our ceiling paint. This is a great product, especially if you're going to put color on your ceiling, if you want something other than your typical whites. We can tint this up to any Benjamin Moore color, match almost all of our competitor colors. Um, and and you, again, you can put it on a seat. This is an ultra flat finish. And the, the two reasons behind that, well, the biggest reason is um, the biggest open areas that we have is going to be our ceilings. We don't typically have pictures hanging from our ceilings. We don't normally have too many things at all on our ceilings, except for maybe a light or a ceiling fan or something. Um, so you have a big, giant, wide open areas. Well, any flaws that are in that or gaps or cracks are going to, your eye will be drawn immediately. So the flatter the finish is, the more it's going to break. So that's why a lot of times you'll see the popcorn finish ceilings. The purpose of that isn't to aggravate somebody trying to repair them. The, pur the purpose of that is to actually break up the imperfections in the surface so it's harder for your eyes to pick it up. It distracts your eye and then you move on to something else. Uh, but again, this can be made into any color. Classically, we used to have, um, with the old colorant systems, we used to have what we call glycol colorants. And typically a lot of people, if they wanted to use a color, they would get a flat finish. And then they would get it mixed in the flat and then put it to the ceiling. However, when you mix traditional colorants in normally what happens is your sheen, your gloss can start gumming up because of the colorants will actually have a little bit of sheen to them. Uh, we have new technology in waterborne colorants and that doesn't happen with this. So if you get a base, a really dark or bright color in this, you won't have a bump up in sheen with it. Uh, another unique product is our Benjamin Moore Advance. This is a uh, usually generally a trim paint, uh, but you, you could use it on a wall if you want. Uh, right now there's a satin semi-gloss and a high gloss finish on this. This is an oil-based paint, and people say, ah, I don't want to use oil, it smells, it's not. This is a waterborne oil-based paint. 
So it does have the same resin or similar resin to typical oil-based paints. However, this is a, a plant oil that we've modified to be dispersed in a water solution. So this is an extremely low odor. It doesn't have the typical solvents that you'd find in oil-based paints in it. This has almost every one of the characteristics you like about oil-based paints and minimizes most of the ones you don't like. One of the big ones is odor. A lot of people don't, and I don't blame them. I don't like using oil-based paints. They have a strong odor. It takes a while for that to dissipate. This is dispersed in water, so you don't have that odor. Uh, the other nice thing is if you, if you have a really white trim, classic oil-based paints can yellow rather quickly when exposed to ultraviolet light or completely blocked off from ultraviolet light. We see this a lot with formal dining rooms with pocket doors. We paint the trims in the door at the same time in a nice oil-based white finish. Christmas, Thanksgiving rolls around, you close the doors, and all of a sudden, well, who painted the doors yellow? Well, no one did. When you put them away and they're uh, completely devoid of light, they can actually yellow faster. So your doors will actually be a little bit of, the, uh, the resin in the uh, uh, advance actually minimizes that color drift from white to yellow and things like that. It doesn't completely eliminate it because it does have an oil resin in it, but it very much reduces it from a classic oil finish. I mean, all you have to do is look at any of the oils, corn oil, uh, olive oil, they all have a little bit of an amberish yellow cast to them. Uh, so that's where it really comes from. And over time, it can get a little bit worse. Uh, then we have, of course, our typical wall coatings. We have the commercial coatings from our ultra spec line to our super high line. A little bit used more for commercial projects, apartment maintenance and things like that, where you kind of want to get something on there that's going to look good, uh, maybe not be the best quality, but uh, budget conscious. Uh, and of course, we have our, our Ben line and our, our premium Regal Select line. The nice thing about our Regal Select line is we have a, a variety of finishes in it. We have a flat finish, which would typically either be used for walls or ceiling. Uh, then we have a matte finish. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there because a lot of people, um, when you start talking about finishes, there's, there are no industry rules. Someone's satin finish might be more related to someone's semi-gloss finish or something like that. We do have sheen cards here. You can always take a look at the sheen card to make sure you're getting the gloss you want. However, I get a questions a lot. Well, what's the difference between flat and matte? Well, typically matte is a newer finish. Flat is a much older finish, but people wanted to put a flat in an area because they, A, they wanted to either um, hide some imperfections or they just, they're just uh, adverse to sheen. They don't like the high sheen, so they wanted to use a flat. The problem with flat paints is they're not very scrubbable. They're somewhat washable, and there's another thing, the difference between washable and scrubbable. Flats typically aren't very scrubbable, and so you can have some issues with that. So what the industry done, it has done and Benjamin Moore has done is we introduced a matte finish. And the matte is basically a flat finish with just a little bit of sheen and just give it that little bit of extra durability, washability, and scrubability over the flat. So you can put something on a wall that appears to be flat, uh, but will have a little bit of durability to it. The next step up from there would be an eggshell finish. And that, that, the eggshell and the matte are kind of battling for probably 20 years now. The eggshell finish has been uh, the most popular for a wall finish. Recently, the last few years, the matte finish is kind of catching up. So the matte and the eggshell are almost neck and neck for your most popular wall finish. Uh, from there, in the Regal line, we go up to what we call a pearl finish, which is somewhat similar to what you'd find a satin finish in other places. That's a nice alternative if you don't want to go all the way up to a semi-gloss. You do need a little extra protection in the area, maybe your uh, entranceway or your home where people are kicking shoes off and everybody comes to your house, comes in through that, that front entrance there and it starts to get dirty and dingy. Um, you want something with a little bit more durability there, a little sheen. This comes in a pearl finish, which is nice. Again, you don't have to go all the way up to the semi-gloss finish. Uh, and it also can be used on trim and things like that. Again, if you don't want to stay, uh, if you want to stay a little bit away from the semi-gloss type finish. And then it is available, as I said, in the semi-gloss. So there's a flat, a matte, an eggshell, pearl, and a semi-gloss in the Regal line. So pretty much cover all your coating needs. If you need something higher than a semi-gloss, I definitely recommend our Advance. The high gloss and the Advance does another thing that latex base paints have a hard time doing. The high gloss, the sheen of it is something very difficult for latex paints to get to. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have oil and it dries and it gets hard, it actually looks very, very shiny. Uh, and that's the Advance. The Advance will, will give you that wet look. Uh, it's typically used in the area where you want to accentuate something, maybe a fireplace. Uh, maybe you have some artwork you want to frame off and uh, draw your eye to it. So you do something, a high sheen, that will pull your eye into uh, to the artwork or the area where you're trying to uh, attract attention to. Any questions about painter, paint primers, finish coats, um, drywall repair? Again, these are, major, uh, generally speaking, kind of the minor repairs. 
um, you know, getting into major repairs or as someone mentioned earlier, large plaster repairs or something like that, you may want to uh, go with a professional or gain a little bit of experience and test out a couple things to be sure you're going to get the finish you want. But again, the big, one of the bigger issues is you do end up making a nice repair on your wall. It's nice and flat and flush and the rest of the wall was painted five times and there'll be a little bit of a texture difference here. Uh, so just keep that in mind. What a lot of guys will do is when they spot prime these in, they'll just do a, maybe a spot primer or whatever, they'll, a heavier nap roller to actually put a little texture on the primer so that you get some of the texturing back so it's not as obvious as a transition. Again, going down in sheen will help that uh, greatly as well. Stepping down to say a matte finish from an eggshell will help with that. Any other questions, problems that you've had, or concerns? I'm sorry? Uh, yes, that, that, that's, there's no extra charge for that. <laughs> it's, uh, that's my logo, actually. It's, it's in all of my work. So, um, Yeah, but that's why you want to definitely pay attention to your stuff and not touch it and make sure it's dry. Uh, before you start overcoating it. Uh, this time of the year, we get a lot of humidity out. If you do extensive amount of patchwork, rush your paint jobs, you can get what we call blisters, where all of a sudden you, you, everything looks fine. You come back in a couple hours and all of a sudden your, your wall has blisters and spot. It's typically what happens is there's just too much moisture still in the wall um, and you're gonna just uh, need to allow that to dry, uh, uh, sand the, the blisters and then recoat the wall. Uh, but you don't, you don't wanna rush it. You wanna be sure it dries thoroughly before you coat it. Again, reading the backs of the cans, um, the paint cans and especially the, uh, the different types of joint compounds that are out there to make sure you're using the appropriate one for yourself.